The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship. We especially welcome those who are worshiping online. We're so glad that you are with us this day. And we welcome our guests and visitors. We're so glad to be together today. Uh, and we hope you all will come back next week as we have a special Earth Day experience in between our worship services. There will be a special community worship service at 945 in the Turner Pavilion. This is the second annual community Earth Day worship service. We did it last year. It was so much fun. Decided to do it again. Uh, eight or ten congregations are going to all be coming together from uh, different faith communities here in Harrisonburg. Uh, and that could be your primary worship experience next Sunday, if you so choose. Uh, or uh, we're inviting folks to use that as your faith formation hour, a Sunday school experience. Uh, so our children and youth will be at that for Sunday school next Sunday. And we hope you'll join us there. Uh, and then also at worship here in the sanctuary, as usual, at 8.30 and 11.00. Lots more in the chimes. I encourage you to read and take home, uh, but we want to begin this day with a moment of celebrating our gathered community. So I invite us all to please rise and greet someone around you. Maybe say hi to someone you don't know. If you're worshiping online, use the chat. our hearts and minds for worship with the music of the prelude. Recalling God's promise of new life in the waters of baptism, we rise and face the font as we give thanks for this gift. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, 
calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray. Mighty and merciful God, you call us to support the weak, to help those who suffer, and to honor all people. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make us advocates for your justice and instruments of your peace, so that all may be reconciled in your beloved community. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite our children forward. Come on down. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi there. You wanna come sit next you wanna come sit next to me? You wanna come sit here? You can sit with your dad, that's okay. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. thank you for answering. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I have noticed with Pastor Alex, our other pastor, who hasn't been around the last few weeks because he's at home with his new baby. One of the things I've noticed that's happened in our worship with him not being here is a definitive lack of sports analogies and sermons. We haven't been talking about sports anywhere near as much as we do when Pastor Alex is here. And if he had been here these past few weeks, he would have been talking about basketball a lot. Did you guys watch any of the basketball tournaments? Or you know people who were into it? You watched some of it, yeah? You like basketball? It's a fun sport, huh? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is interesting to pay attention to in basketball is that sometimes when two people crash into each other and one of them falls down, what happens? They might get hurt, yeah. Does anyone help them? Help them up? I love it when I see someone from the opposing team reach out their hand and help him get, or her, get up, right? I just think that's beautiful, that even though they're fighting it out on the basketball court, they're like, hey man, I'll help you up. They care about each other enough to lift each other up when one of them falls. And I think that's something that we're called to do as people of God. We're gonna hear a story in just a minute about a guy named Peter who meets a man who needs some help getting up, standing up. And Peter lifts out his hand and, and says, rise up. And that word that he uses, rise up, is the same word in Greek that we use, uh, that, that's used for, for Jesus' resurrection in the Bible. So it's like this connection between Jesus rising from the grave and this man rising up. And, and we get to be people who help People experience that rising up because when someone falls down on the playground or whenever, you know, you can put out your hands and help. And when you fall down, sometimes it can be hard to ask for help or accept help, right? It's all right because God sends people to st stick their hand out and say, hey, let me help you up. That's what it means to be part of the people of God. So while there are definitely things that happen in basketball that we maybe shouldn't do in our day-to-day -day lives, one of the things we need to remember is to stick out our hand and help somebody stand up when they need that help. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for sending Jesus, for connecting us to Jesus through our baptisms, and for us now on this side of Easter to get to experience being raised up by you through the hands of other people. Help us to remember to stick out a helping hand and help people stand up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. The first reading is from the third chapter of Acts. 
One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go in to the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus and the disciples had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. be seated. I have a confession to make. I don't always really like the healing stories in the Bible. Maybe that seems like a strange thing to come from a pastor. After all, don't I love the Bible? I mean, to be clear, yes, I do. So why wouldn't I like these stories that show the mighty power of God, the healing touch that comes through our Savior, the transformation of life that's possible in the presence of the Holy Spirit? Well, sometimes I don't like them because they seem so quick and neat and tidy when the healing that I've seen and experienced myself often seems to be slow and messy. I don't always like them because they raise so many questions in my heart about why some people are cured from disease and others aren't. I don't like them because they imply, often, that people who are disabled, like the man who we meet in today's story, are somehow less than or not fully human until their physical infirmity is gone. 
I don't like them because these stories are too often used to justify horrible theology that if a person just has enough faith, then they'll be cured. I don't like them because they make me wonder why all followers of Jesus can't perform healing miracles like Peter. Are we doing something wrong? And so, to be honest, I often rush through them, relegating these stories to an ancient history, a time when crazy miracles like this happened, because that's just not how things are now. Maybe that's my real confession. These stories make me uncomfortable, and it's so much easier to to just skim through, do a surface reading, praise the God who heals us, and move on. Maybe you feel that way sometimes, too. But this story from Acts won't let us do that. It asks us to slow down, invites us to see, compels us to act. Let's start at the beginning. Remember last week we heard the story of Jesus ascending into heaven. And before he did that, he declared that his followers will receive the Holy Spirit and will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. The next part of the story that we skipped over today narrates the day of Pentecost. And so we'll read that story again in a few weeks. When the Holy Spirit did indeed descend upon them, and Peter stands up and preaches this inspired sermon that compels thousands of people to be baptized, and this community begins to form where they eat meals and they pray and they learn together. And Acts tells us that many wonders and signs were being done. So then we get today's story, this example of what kinds of wonders and signs were being done. Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray. It was a regular time to gather for worship. So this was just them going about their daily routine, just like how we got up and came to church today. And they encounter a man begging for alms, which is not particularly remarkable for either that day or ours, right? We often pass folks in town who are looking for a few bucks. Now, already I am starting to not really like this story because, first of all, we don't know this man's name. He is known solely by his disability. How many times does that happen in our world, too? All too often, people are either defined by their disability or they're made to feel invisible or looked over because they don't live up to some sort of standard that we think is ideal. They're made to feel like they're unimportant or don't count or they are just literally unseen. I know a woman who is a wheelchair user, and her her actual next-door neighbors that she had lived next to for several years didn't recognize her the one time she switched to using a scooter. These people who saw her every day did not actually see her. They only saw the device that helped her get around, and when she had a different device, they didn't recognize her. They'd never actually seen her. And apparently the person telling this story in Acts also only really sees this man's disability. Because that's all we know about him. That he's been unable to use his legs in a typical way since he was born. We find out later in the story that he was more than 40 years old. So this has been going on a long time time, that he's been sitting outside the temple every day, begging for money so he could survive, and apparently no one knows anything about him except that he's the crippled guy. That hurts my heart. 
And again, before we're too quick to judge, you know, people back then, a recent study found that 67% of people reported feeling uncomfortable talking to a disabled person. Two-thirds of the people asked are uncomfortable to talk with someone who has a disability. Disabled people make up about 25% of the U.S. population, yet disabled people still make the majority of their neighbors uncomfortable simply by existing. This man is also apparently viewed as a, a bit of a charity case. I suppose it's good, right, that people carried him to the temple so he could sit there and, and beg but I sure do wish that this man had been given more humanity and dignity than that. He does not appear to be able to go in and worship. There are scholarly debates about whether he would have been allowed into the temple or not. There were laws at the time that disabled people could not be priests and enter into the holy places, but it's a little unclear how much that applied to average people. But the fact is that he can't get in because he has no way to get in unless someone carries him in. There are actual physical barriers to his entry into worship. And so often, all too often, the way that society has structured itself and its buildings excludes the full participation of people who need to access the world in particular ways. Columbia University professor Christopher Boswell proclaims, it is only at the Bodleian that I am a cripple. With that startling headline, he writes about how when he uses the British Library, he can move around easily and get the information he needs just like anyone else in the library. However, at Oxford's Bodleian Library, at least at the time he wrote the article, he cannot even enter the building and up its large staircase without help, not to mention the difficult navigating once he is inside. So in this case, Boswell argues, it's not his paraplegia that disables him because that remains constant, whether he is in the British Library or the Bodleian. But in only one context does he experience himself as disabled. And again, lest we think, gosh, I'm glad we're so much more enlightened in the church, let me remind you that churches are exempt from the American Disabilities Act. Churches are not required to provide accommodations for disabled people. And the reason for that is because some Christian communities fought really hard against that law when it was coming up to be passed. And so this law that, that finally granted accessible bathrooms and ramps in public spaces and accessible parking, these basic things that allow folks whose bodies are different than the socially constructed idea of what's normal to simply exist and function in the world, this law was vehemently condemned by some Christian churches and schools as, quote, imposing burdensome costs and needless injury to religious exercise. So at the end of the day, money was more important than people. And evidently, in the minds of some, the very presence of disabled people in the worshiping community diminished the ability of others to worship. The Christian community has far too often been complicit in spreading the lie that some bodies contain more worth than others. The Christian community has far too often gone along with the idea that the problem is that some people's bodies don't live up to our ideal, rather than seeing that the problem is that the community has willingly structured itself to exclude those who we think are too different, and that it doesn't have to be that way. So this nameless guy from 2,000 years ago, made invisible by the people around him, excluded from the worshiping community, 
told implicitly and sometimes explicitly that he doesn't have the same worth as other people, that guy still exists. A lot of people who identify with his situation still exist. But here's something I do like about this story. It's actually something I like a lot. Peter and John stop, and they look intently at this man. They don't stare at him like as the other, right? Like that's a very different kind of gaze, but they, they look intently, they see him. They see him. And this man who has learned that he needs to keep his head down in shame, that, that he has to, has to keep his place, this lower place as he is begging, he is invited to lift his head and look at them. They fix their attention on each other. They see each other. They see the humanity in each other. They see the image of God in each other. And that moment is when the healing begins. Because here's the thing, there's a difference between curing and healing, right? In this case, the man is about to, in a few minutes, experience a cure, and we can celebrate that whenever and wherever it happens. But the end goal for all of us is not curing, because all of us will someday reach a point where we will not be cured. So the end goal in God's kingdom is healing, a restoration of dignity and worth and belonging and community. Rachel Held Evans wrote, the church is called to slow and difficult work of healing. We are called to enter into one another's pain, anoint the sick, and stick around, no matter the outcome. And Amy Kenny, in her phenomenal book called My Body is Not a Prayer Request, highly recommend that book, she follows this by saying, so instead of trying to cure all disabilities, the church should do the slow and difficult work of healing the surrounding society by tearing down spaces, practices, and mindsets that are inaccessible to disabled people, even when those spaces are inside the church itself. The church should follow Jesus by healing instead of curing. And the place to start is by seeing each other. Not staring at the other because they're different, but getting to know one another as more than a diagnosis, more than a perceived deformity, more than an object to be pitied, but truly and genuinely seeing each other as fellow children of God who bear God's image in all of its distinctive beauty, who are all called to live abundant life, who all bear a unique witness to God's glory. And y'all, this can be so incredibly freeing for all of us, whether we consider ourselves disabled or not. We all suffer when we perpetuate the lie that some bodies are more worthy than others. When we convince ourselves that people are only valued for what they produce, when we withhold belonging until we prove that we are worthy of it. Our GPAs and our resumes are not more important than our humanity. And we are called to the healing work of recognizing our interdependence and the beautiful goodness of community when we value one another as image bearers of God. When we do that, then we don't have to focus on making ourselves better somehow, of, of living up to some unattainable ideal about the perfect body. We're called to recognize and bear witness to the image of God in our neighbor. We are called to recognize that in the beloved community, one person's struggle is everyone's struggle. We are called to invest in one another's flourishing. 
As Kenny says, that means we do not need to seek to fix our neighbor's physical impairment, but to seek to generate a world that does not encumber our neighbor for that impairment. Because disability is part of what it means to be human. You know, those of us who think, well, this conversation about disability doesn't apply to me, well, the reality is that we're all only temporarily non-disabled. Our bodies will not always be able to do all the things. It's an inevitable part of our experience, the transformation of the flesh as it encounters the world. And the most beautiful, most holy place that we witness that is in the person of Jesus. Remember, after Jesus is resurrected, his body is still scarred. It's disfigured. It's disabled. Jesus' scarred, disabled body is the example of the imperishable form transformed for the glory of God. This disabled body is the exemplar for how our own bodies will be transformed in the eschaton. Instead of dismissing disability as ugly or unnatural, we should perceive it as connected to the imperishable body of Christ, whose beautiful, disabling wounds are the marks of our healing. And so it is that at the beautiful gate, in the name of this Jesus, a crippled man is healed. His healing story does involve a cure as well, but it didn't have to. The important thing is that this man is able to now enter the worship space with other people and praise God together with them. He receives strength from God, recognition by other people, unexpected joy, and new life through the resurrected yet disabled Savior of the world. I said at the beginning that I didn't necessarily like this story because it makes me wonder why all followers of Jesus can't perform healing miracles. But that's not true. We can all be healers. We can be witnesses to the healing power of Jesus. And we are. This is a welcoming place. And we do have handicapped spots and curb cuts and accessible bathrooms. And I'm proud of the way we bring our worship out into the world through our online ministry. I'm thrilled to see the ways that our children and youth ministries are being led in ways that create space for neurodiverse learners to engage. These are ways in which we participate in the healing of the world. And yet, our work is not done. This is still a really difficult space for someone to hear when someone's talking, right? This is why so many people sit in the back, right? Because they can hear a little bit better back there. Even a mild hearing impairment greatly hampers a person's ability to worship in this space. And we've been talking for years about measures we can take to make that better. And one of the big hangups is the cost of making those changes. And that's just one example of a practical thing that, that we can talk about, and we can think about, about ways in which we're being called to continue to be a healing presence in this space and out in the world. So as we continue to explore who we are as a community and who God is calling us to be, let's make sure we are centering the voices of those who are all too often excluded and continuing to live into this beloved community that God has brought us together to be, one in which we get to experience the presence of God in one another in all of our diversity, and live together into resurrection life. Because that is a story that I really like, and it's a story that all of us will love. Amen.
please join me as we confess our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, he was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in one Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. O oh God, train us to recognize goodness in the world around us. Lead us to share all that we have. Nourish us with life that is generous. Encourage us to help others stand up. Merciful God, receive us. Creator, you love all life on earth. Rouse in us a reverence for creation that we take greater care of its resources. Protect the climate so that this planet will sustain life in all of its variety. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for those in positions of authority. Guide them to lead with integrity and compassion. Inspire wisdom and guidance to the leaders of Israel and Iran. Empower them to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You care for all your children. Supply us with the courage during times of transition, facing loss, and anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief and fill us with hope when we are uncertain. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Bring all people together around the world. Help us to remember our purpose and our ministry. As we prepare for this week's journey, move us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Share your love with these members, Charles, Susan, and Sarah Kaiser, David and Donna Kaiser, Keith and Teresa Kaiser, Luke Kaiser and Isabella Kaiser, Larry Knott, merciful God, receive our prayer. As we remember and share your love, comfort those who mourn. Remind us of your promise that we are held in your love forever. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. We greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
holy, living, and loving God, we praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people Israel from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your Son to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who, living among us, healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life, that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, invites us to this table. Alleluia. Come to the feast. You may be seated. For those worshiping online, I invite you to take the bread. This is the body of Christ given for you. And the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Amen.